Today I want to talk to you about my DCF valuation for McKesson. Now this video is intended to go hand in hand with an article I wrote for Seeking Alpha on McKesson. So it's best if you watch the video and read the article together. Now I don't know about you, but in the current market environment, I am finding it really difficult to find undervalued companies. It seems like most companies that I do a DCF valuation for uh, lately have been either fairly valued or overvalued, and it's rare that I find a company that's undervalued. And so that's why I wanted to write an article about McKesson and share with you kind of my findings. So let's, let's dive into um, the assumptions here for my, my valuation. You can see here that I've got uh, revenues coming off a base of about 200 million. Over the past 12 months, McKesson's done about 200 billion in revenues, which may seem like a lot, um, but McKesson is in the pharmaceutical distribution business. And so as a distributor, you've got large, large revenues and uh, low, low margins. And it's, it's one of three major players. It's one of three in an oligopoly in this pharmaceutical distribution business. The other players being Cardinal Health and Amerisource uh, Burgeon. Now, uh, I don't think my assumptions for revenue growth are overly ambitious. Um, what I'm estimating is in the first five years, the company will um, have average growth, growth of about 4% a year compounded. And then in years 6 through 10, I estimate that uh, revenues will grow an average of about 3% a year. And that's not to say it's going to be a level 3% every year for those years. It's actually kind of stepping down from that 4% level um, over that five-year period to get down to um, the 2.26% growth I show here for year t after year 10. And that 2.26% number is equivalent, at least as of today, to the um, the yield on a 10-year Treasury note, uh, which you know in theory should represent kind of our expectations for um, growth of the economy uh, as it stands right now. So uh, I'm I'm not estimating any robust growth. Uh, it, this is fairly innocuous growth. I mean, it, it, it's not like a high growth industry, but, um, but it is growing with the demographics where you've got baby boomers who are getting older. Um, healthcare in general, I think, probably see more growth than the general economy just because of the aging population that we have and more and more prescriptions um, needing to be filled, and more and more... Uh, prescriptions being purchased. So, um, and as you can see in my operating margins, um, the base year, this last year, it had a irregular, uh, it, it's higher than, than typical because of a one-time benefit related to a transaction, a joint venture called Change Healthcare that McKesson had entered into. Um, where one of its business segments, the, its technology solutions business segment, it seems like it's really winding that down and so it contributed a lot of that business towards this joint venture. And, and so with some funky accounting, um, that resulted in a higher um, operating income and therefore higher operating margin last year. So, so um, but, but if you look historically, uh, McKesson has done a, uh, had operating margins of about 1.8%. And so that's what I've assumed is just a level 1.8% 1, 1. over my entire 10 year um, forecast period. And then in, and, and after year 10, also at 1.8%. So I'm assuming steady margins at about that rate. I mean, there is a possibility on the latest earnings call, McKesson management um, kind of, you know, talked about how the specialty pharmaceutical portion of their business um, and some other parts of their business have actually higher margins um, than, than a lot of their business. And so, you know, I don't know. I can't really tell what the future is. I mean, maybe there's a possibility 
margins could be a little bit better, but but I think 1.8% is a reasonable number to go with. For the tax rate, um, I estimate 30% uh, tax rate. I'm not sure what are, what's going to happen in Congress with taxes, um, but I'm assuming 30%, which is the historically, when you look back at the median tax rate over the last 10, last five years, um, over both the last 10 and five year period, the tax rate has been 30%, uh, the median tax rate. So I, that's what I stuck with, even though it was lower this last year than that. Uh, so uh, net re reinvestment, going to net reinvestment. Um, so this, this last year, I calculated that, um, and when I say net, that means above and beyond uh, amortization, depreciation. So if, you, if you're thinking about CapEx, uh, I'm, I'm talking about kind of your um, growth CapEx, not your, you know, if, if we assume kind of maintenance CapEx is captured in, um, when you do a DCF in the uh, depreciation, amortization um, portion, the net capex is be you know what the company has to sp to spend beyond um, the depreciation, amortization expense to uh, grow the company. Because at the end of the day, all companies have to invest money to grow. And so to get that 4% a year or 3% a year in growth that I'm assuming in revenues, they're going to have to reinvest some of the earnings uh, back into the business. And so what I do, and those of you who um, follow uh, Professor DeModeran from NYU and watch his videos and um, look at how he does it uh, typically in a DCF is is he'll, he'll look at sales to capital ratios, which I think is, is good. And if you look at long term, this is a good way to do it. And this is how I do it for the most part. Um, so you look at, you know, kind of historically uh, and in the industry, um, how many dollars of sales can you get, does the company or the business get from reinvesting $1 back into the business? And so for McKesson, it's actually pretty dang high um, compared to a lot of different uh, industries and businesses. And historically, it's been around 12 to 13, uh, where every dollar they put back into the business, they generate 12 to 13 dollars in revenue. And, and you can see why it's high for a distributor, because revenues, um, and for retailers, it's also high, because you know, revenues are, are very large. Um, but the margins are very small. So, um, so that's what I'm estimating is that for every, you know, for every um, dollar that they reinvest, they get about twelve dollars, twelve to thirteen dollars in return. That's why I have a sales to capital ratio of twelve, and then it kind of grows to thirteen, thinking that they might get a little bit even more um, efficient. Uh, they get. You know, so so to grow the revenues at four percent, um, the calculation comes out to be that they would have to reinvest net seven hundred six million of their operating earnings, um, and then and then in years six to ten, you know, five ninety six, um, and then after year ten, about four hundred seventy eight million a year, and so as a percentage of after tax operating earnings. That's what the reinvestment rate is, is the percentage of after-tax operating earnings um, that is being reinvested. So that comes out to be, that $706 million comes out to be about 25%, and then this, you know, $600,596 comes out to be uh, about 17%. So, uh, so the reinvestment rate kind of drops over time, and that, that makes sense because as, as, as revenues, uh, revenue growth slows, um, you, don't, you don't have to put reinvest as much back in the business, you know, to generate 2% versus when you wanted to generate 4% in growth. Uh, and so that was probably a longer explanation than it need to be. Um, and so my return on capital, um, you know, so if you're reinvesting capital back in the business, you know, we're taking that into account to see what your return on, what the company's return on capital would be 
um, every year, which is is uh, is your operating earnings, after-tax operating earnings divided by your um, total capital. Uh, that that equals your return on capital. And so, you know, year one through five, I have that about fifteen point eight five percent, and that kind of stays steady. Um, all the way to the end. So it's around 15% return on invested capital. Um, <clears throat> and, and which I don't think is too high. Uh, I think it's about right. And uh, historically, they've had actually a higher, you can see the base was 32%. Uh, McKesson, and that's another reason I like, it. I think management's very good. And historically, they have um, chosen projects and acquisitions that have generated high returns on invested capital. Uh, and so they do not have a track record of squandering, um, uh, squandering shareholder money uh, on, on projects and acquisitions that they, they choose. Cost of capital, uh, it's a fairly stable business. I mean, I think it's going to be around for, for quite a while, uh, just, just kind of the position and the value that they bring to the supply chain and the pharmaceutical industry. So I've got their uh, co the cost of capital, and with rates where they are so low, uh, I think it's a reasonable cost of capital. Have it going from 8% at the beginning of my DCF, um, and then as you see after year 10, dropping down a little bit to 7.5%. So down here, if we look at, at, at the cash flows, um, I have, I can zoom out a little bit, but uh, you can see my revenues how they, they grow over time. You can see the operating margin staying steady. This results in a, a operating earnings. That's what the EBIT is, it's the operating earnings growing from 3.7 billion <clears throat> up to about 5 billion. And then the after tax operating earnings, 2.6 billion to 3.6 billion over that period. Uh, so growing by about a billion. And then um, net reinvestment here so you take take uh, net reinvestment from the after-tax operating earnings to get to the free cash flow numbers, and so I'm projecting free cash flow growing from about two billion this next year to about three billion in um, in in the terminal year there, and so so basically I estimate this company is a company. My story for the company is that this company is a company that can grow. Um, you know, free cash flows and, and, and keep free cash flows at about a $3 billion level into perpetuity. And, and so I, th I think that's fairly reasonable given that, you know, this last year, granted there were some one-time things, but the free cash flow is over $4 billion. And the year before that, it was a little over $3 billion. So it's already hitting at about that mark. So maybe I'm a little too conservative in my earlier years here where I have it only down at, at $2 billion. But in the, the, the end result here is, uh, you know, my terminal value, uh, the present value of the terminal value is about $27.5 billion. The present value of the cash flows over the next 10 years is about, about $16 billion. You add those together. The value of the operating assets of the business, uh, which we call kind of the value of the firm, is $43.5 billion. And then uh, when you adjust for um, debt and minority interest, um, subtracting that, and then adding back in cash and other non-operating assets, uh, for instance, the um, equity investment that they have in this joint venture, Change Healthcare, um, you get you still have net uh, net debt. And so it, it reduces the firm value from that 43.5 down to 40, about 40.5, so by, by about 3 billion. Divide that by the number of shares, you get to an equity value per share of 189.72. And uh, the stock, at least today, was trading, I think it was below, it was probably about 154, um, so around 154, 155. Which gives you an upside potential to their value of uh, 22.4%. So I, I I think you know while while you know some of you guys may kind of thumb your nose at the uh, only having a 20% and a margin of safety, 
Um, in my mind, this is a, a stable business uh, with great management, great uh, returns on invested capital that, that they can com compound the business uh, very well. Plus, the, the current market environment, it's hard to find something, um, especially in the large cap space, that is undervalued by over 20%. Anyway, I'll leave you with that. Feel free to leave comments. I'd uh, love to hear from you. Thanks.